Hello students, this is Professor Del Russo and this is a lecture on bail in the state of New Jersey. In New Jersey, there's a constitutional right to bail. All persons have a right to bail. And the New Jersey Supreme Court case that ruled that all persons have a right to bail and based that decision on the New Jersey and federal constitutions was State versus Craig Johnson, a 1972 case. Turns out that in 1971, 18-year-old Craig Johnson was indicted in Union County for first-degree capital murder. Now, capital meant any crime that could get the death penalty. So Craig Johnson was denied bail. Well, in 1972, the United States Supreme Court ruled the death penalty unconstitutional. Now, the New Jersey Constitution said that all persons were entitled to bail unless the death penalty was likely. So if you were charged with a crime like Craig Johnson was, that might result in the death penalty, then you did not have a right to bail. However, since the U.S. Supreme Court overruled the death penalty, Craig Johnson argued in the case of State versus Johnson that he is now entitled to bail because there is no more capital murder in the state of New Jersey. And in the Johnson case, the New Jersey Supreme Court agreed, and they also provided guidelines that have controlled issues surrounding bail for over 35 years, only recently having been changed by a constitutional amendment. Nevertheless, the process remains very similar. Let's take a look at the philosophy surrounding bail. The Constitution does require bail in non-capital cases, and bail is based upon the presumption of innocence. It would make no sense to put people in jail and tell them they can't get out until their case is decided if we have the presumption of innocence. For the presumption of innocence to have any meaning, people who are charged with a crime and presumed to be innocent have to have a way to get out of jail. But it brings up the issue of, well, what happens if they flee or they run? And that's what the primary consideration is for bail, as you'll see in a moment. Bail also allows the accused to better prepare a defense. It's not easy to prepare your defense, work with your lawyer, interview witnesses, and gather evidence if you're in jail. So bail allows the accused a much better opportunity to prepare his case. Bail obviously also discriminates against the poor because bail requires that you submit a certain amount of money in order to get out of jail in most cases. And bail should not be excessive according to State versus Johnson and theory on bail. And Johnson also said excessive bail should not be a substitute for pretrial detention. Because New Jersey did not have pretrial detention in 1972, and still does not until the constitutional amendment becomes operative. The courts have been advised that you cannot use extremely high bails as an analog for pretrial detention. That is, you can't make the bail really high so the guy can't get out of jail. However, we're going to take another look at pretrial detention in a little while when we discuss the constitutional amendment that is effective in 2017. In New Jersey, the primary purpose of bail is to assure the accused's presence at trial. The analysis is directed solely towards making sure that the accused shows up to court. Now, there are a lot of issues surrounding bail, its constitutionality, its disparate impact on the poor and indigent, its disparate impact upon um, uh, ethnic minorities, and it is well documented there are some readings in your course materials that can provide a complete analysis of bail's impact on the accused. So when a judge is setting bail and a prosecutor is arguing for a particular bail amount and a defense lawyer is arguing against a particular bail amount, what are the criteria for imposing bail? Uh, the courts have outlined them. These are right from the Johnson case, and they have also been codified in the New Jersey Rules of Court. The judge has to take a look at the seriousness of the crime charged against the defendant, the apparent likelihood of conviction, 
and the punishment prescribed by the legislature. And the reason that is important is we are trying to evaluate whether the accused is going to show up for trial. So the question is, who is more likely to run? And the person who is facing a lot of years in jail and is charged with a serious crime is more likely to not worry about the money he or she has posted and be more concerned about their liberty, and that is not going to jail, so they might flee and forfeit the money. So the more serious the crime, the higher the penalty, the higher the bail should be to make sure they show up for court. You want to try to create a state of equipoise or equilibrium between the likelihood of flight and the amount of money or property or both that the defendant has at risk. So the seriousness of the crime is important in evaluating whether a defendant is going to flee. For example, if you're facing life imprisonment, you're more likely to flee than if you're facing six months in jail or probation. Those kinds of offenses should, in most cases, and all things being equal, receive a dramatically less bail than someone who's facing 30, 60, or life imprisonment. The defendant's criminal record is relevant in imposing bail. The fact that the defendant has committed a crime or multiple crimes matters. The fact that a defendant or an accused has violated the law in the past may shed some light on whether he's going to take the requirement that he show up for court seriously. Criminal violations can be seen as a record of a person's not following the rules. People who commit crimes are rule breakers and rule breakers are more likely to flee than people who follow the rules. Another issue the judge will consider in setting the appropriate bail is the defendant's previous record on bail, if there is any. So if a defendant has a criminal record and they've been placed on bail before, did they show up to court on time? Did the judge in the past have to issue a warrant for the defendant's arrest? Were there problems with reporting to bail supervision? In other words, what's their prior track record on bail? Past conduct is the best predictor of future behavior. So if a person has been on bail in the past and they didn't do so well, or they thumbed their nose at the court, or the court had to issue a warrant for their arrest, that's a pretty good indicator that they may not show up as required in the new case. So prior track record or the previous record on bail is always important in evaluating uh, the appropriate bail for a person who is pending trial. The defendant's reputation and mental condition are relevant in imposing bail. Usually that is something that the defense might bring up to show that the defendant has a very good reputation in the community. He's someone who keeps his promises, someone who is a good citizen. The length of the defendant's residence in the community is obviously relevant because if somebody is transient, that is, he lives in Nevada for a few years, he lives in Maine for a couple of years, he spends some time in Florida, well, that person is more likely to flee, more likely to have much less at stake in the community in which he is charged. This criteria is often called roots in the community. So someone who has a home, who has lived in the same place for 10, 15, 20 years perhaps, or maybe their whole life, is more likely to stay and cooperate with the court, show up on time, and go to all of his required court proceedings. So roots in the community are important. If you have a home, if you have friends in the community, if you go to church in the particular community, if you have a lot of relationships and connections in the community, you're a lot less likely to run than someone who has very little connections to the community in which they're charged. And I touched upon number five just a moment ago. Defendants, family ties, and relationships are important for the reasons I just said. Whether someone's working or not, someone who is working is less likely to flee than someone who's unemployed. 
and someone who's been working steadily has a good record of employment and has a good financial condition is a good risk on bail. On the other hand, if you're unemployed, you jump from job to job, you waste all your money, well, that person is less likely to show up at court. That is a person who's less responsible and therefore a higher risk. If there are persons in the community who are considered responsible and they can vouch for the defendant's reliability, and this is something that the defense would focus on, they might bring in a, an accused boss or their pastor at the local church, or they might bring in a, a person who is a important person in the community, someone who is a um, politician or a member of the military or somebody else who is clearly a responsible member of the community and they could say I know the defendant and he's like me he's someone who's reliable and responsible so that is something a judge would take a look at and would be relevant in deciding how much the bail should be and whether someone's a flight risk and any other factors that indicate the defendant's motive of life or his ties to the community or anything else that might bear on the risk of someone not appearing in court in order to answer the charges for which they are accused. If a judge allows a defendant to be released upon bail, the court can attach reasonable conditions on release. Now, the Johnson Court in 1972 did not offer a list. Many jurisdictions have statutes and case law that give examples of or create a list of the kinds of conditions that are reasonable and appropriate to attach to someone's liberty if they get out on bail. The Johnson Court simply said, imposition of conditions on pretrial liberty are within the trial judge's discretion. However, the Johnson Court said, they must be reasonable conditions. So anything that's reasonable and relevant to the crime that the accused is charged with may be attached to his or her release. For example, drug and alcohol rules, if there is a history of drug abuse or alcohol abuse or the offense itself involves drugs, well, there can be drug and alcohol rules which can prohibit the accused from being present in high drug areas. It can also require that the accused have regular drug or alcohol screening, that they have urine testing or other kinds of testing for substances. The court can require that if the defendant gets out of jail on bail, that they maintain employment that they surrender their passport. There may be travel restrictions imposed. They are very common in New Jersey and the condition might be that they have to stay in New Jersey unless they have specific permission of the court. And it's very common for a defendant to ask the court and notify the prosecutor that they want to travel to Florida or maybe to Puerto Rico or maybe they have business in Europe for some reason then they would have to come back to court to get those travel restrictions modified. Another common reasonable condition of bail, especially in crimes involving violence and especially domestic violence and intimate partner violence, is that the accused surrender their weapons. In fact, the statute under the Prevention of Domestic Violence Act requires that in a case involving restraining orders, the accused weapons are immediately seized. Now, those are civil proceedings, not criminal proceedings. If the accused is charged with a crime that involves violence and weapons, certainly the court can order as a condition of release the surrender of all weapons. And in child maltreatment cases, the most common reasonable condition is no victim contact. And any case that has a victim can result in a no victim contact condition of bail. Now, speaking of no victim contact, let's take a closer look at the rules concerning no victim contact in New Jersey 
in child abuse cases. Very recently, I'd say about five years ago, the court rules were amended on the issue of no victim contact in child abuse cases. And the rules now say, when someone is bailed out and there is a condition that there is no victim contact with the child victim in the case, a copy of that bail order that imposes the restrictions has to be transmitted to the family part. And the family court judge that might have jurisdiction over the child protection matter, that is DCP and P, may be in court simultaneous to the criminal case. The family court judge gets a copy of the bail no contact order. And the statute says in number two, these restrictions shall not affect contact authorized by an order of the family part in a child abuse and neglect case entered after any restriction was imposed as part of the bail order. And what that means is the criminal judge imposes a no victim contact provision. He memorializes it in an order. That order has to go to the family court judges and the family court judge who's involved in the child protection part of the case same child, same accused, focuses on child protection within the family part, that judge, knowing that there's a no victim contact provision, can change that no victim contact. In essence, he or she in the family court has jurisdiction over the family aspects of the case. They're in a better position to evaluate the propriety of contact between the child and the accused than the bail judge is. The criminal court judge, when setting bail, is often making this decision on a very limited record. And sometimes the judge who sets bail is not the same judge who's going to hear the case and learn about all the facts of it. There's a very limited amount of information for the bail judge. So the assumption is that the family court is in a much better position to evaluate whether there should be continued contact or not. So the family court judge has the final say on whether there ought to be contact. However, the prosecutor needs to be advised so that she or he can be heard in the family court because they're in the best position in many cases to know the facts of the case and the dynamics of the family because during their investigation, they likely learned a lot about those things. So it's important and the statute provides that the prosecutor be notified that the family part might change the bail condition. Well, bail requires that you post some kind of security to ensure that you show up to court. The court and the system wants insurance that the accused is going to show up. Again, that's the purpose of bail, to ensure that the accused shows up to court. So usually it's money or property. You can have a cash bail, which requires the accused to post the full cash amount of the bail. And the court can order that and say, you're not allowed to use a bondsman. Now, a bondsman is a professional who essentially lends money to the accused. So if the bail is $50,000, a bondsman can be hired by the accused and that bondsman will post the bail. They don't really put the money up. They buy an insurance contract that ensures that if the person flees that the $50,000 will be paid. It's a rather complex process. Nevertheless, bondable bail involves a third party posting the bail on behalf of the accused. Now the court, like I said a moment ago, can require no bail bonds person, cash bail, or $50,000 surety. Surety means bondable bail. Now, if an accused goes with a bail bondsman, that company posts the bond and there's usually a fee. The fee is typically 10%. So on a 50,000 bail, the accused has to pay $5,000. They don't get that money back. That's the price to be paid for the bonds person putting up the bail. Now, if the accused flees, the bondsman has to give that money to the court. And that's where you get the notion of a 
bounty hunter. A bounty hunter is someone that the bail bonds person hires to go track down fleeing criminals, people who are accused of crimes that have fled because they have an interest in getting their money back. So they may pay a bond, a, they may pay a bounty hunter $2,000 to go find the guy. It's a lot cheaper than losing the whole 50000 10% bail has nothing to do with the bondsman. There are some crimes where the rules allow the accused to put up 10% of the full amount. So let's say the bail is $50,000, but the judge says with a 10% option. Well, in that case, the accused only has to place $5,000 with the court and if he flees, he owes $50,000. And the county, which handles bail throughout New Jersey, they can get a judgment for $50,000 against the, the accused who fled. But in order to get out, the accused only has to post 10% of the full amount. And when the case is over, when the charges are resolved, you are found not guilty or the case is otherwise resolved, you get your 10% back with interest. That $5,000 is posted with the court and you get it back. Now contrast that to the bondable bail. Bondable bail, the bonds person keeps the 10% as a fee. The 10% bail, the court holds the 10% and when the case is over, you get it back with interest. Now, some people are charged with such a minor crime or are so trustworthy, they may be released on their own recognizance. You sometimes see this with high profile defendants, politicians and the like, who have so much to lose by fleeing and the charges sometimes don't require jail. They may be released on their own recognizance, which simply means there's no cash, bond or other security needed you are simply released on your promise to show up in court. Lastly, let's take a look at a little bit of current events. In November 2014, this past election cycle, the voters in the state of New Jersey approved a ballot question amending the New Jersey Constitution as it pertains to bail. Now its effective date is January 2017, so it's quite a way off. And it really overrules State versus Craig Johnson that I talked about at the beginning of this lecture, that 1972 case with the 18 year old who was indicted in Union County for first degree murder. And remember, Craig Johnson said there's no pretrial detention. You can't have pretrial detention, nor can you set a really high bail to, in a sense, get pretrial intervention. A court was not allowed to set a $100 million bail that would be the functional equivalent of no bail or pretrial detention. Well, the New Jersey Constitution was amended and it now allows pretrial detention. If it can be shown that the released defendant will not return to court. Now, this hasn't been tested yet. I got to believe that the evidence has to be compelling in order to not give someone bail on the theory they won't return to court. I have to believe that there's got to be some really compelling evidence that they won't return to court. For example, they've already made plans. They have a fake passport. Uh, there's really powerful evidence of flight to a jurisdiction where they cannot be returned to the New Jersey court system. Nevertheless, if you can prove that as a prosecutor, you can have someone held without bail. The more likely use of pretrial detention is going to be the next two bullet points. And this is what the governor was concerned about when he was advocating for this bill, what prosecutors have been concerned about, and that is gang members and terrorists and people who are an absolute threat to the community, despite the fact that they're presumed innocent. There is a good record of violence or the potential for violence to the person or community. That's a person that may need to be held in jail until their case is resolved. And although the statutes have not yet been passed, 
that provide guidance on these pretrial detentions, I'm sure that there has to be very good evidence, significant evidence, that this person is a danger to the community or persons. Nevertheless, under Craig Johnson case, you couldn't put people in jail no matter how dangerous they were pre-trial. Now you can. And the other instance is when the defendant will obstruct or attempt to obstruct the criminal justice process. So if there's persuasive evidence that the defendant is somehow going to disrupt the criminal justice process in some way, that person can be held without bail. Now the constitutional amendment changed the New Jersey Constitution and it also directed the legislature to draft laws to further refine these rules on pretrial detention that are outlined in the New Jersey Constitution. As I said a moment ago, the New Jersey Constitution is rather sparse. We need the legislature, the lawmakers, to draft guidelines and rules that can help prosecutors apply these pretrial detention rules and defense lawyers to protect the interests of their clients to prevent pretrial detention if they don't think it's appropriate. And that is a quick survey on bail in the state of New Jersey.